Esselamu aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve berekatuhu. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi rabbil alamin. Ve l'akibetu lil muttakina ve la udvana illa ala zalimin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidil evvelina vel ahirina nebiyina Muhammedin ve alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. My dear viewers welcome back to another live edition of Ask Huda. In which you present your questions and we do our level best to answer in the light of the Quran and the sound sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In order to do that, I'd like to remind you of our contact information. If you like to drop us a call, you can call the following two WhatsApp numbers beginning with the area code 001-347-806-0025 or area code 001-361-489-1503. We also have two local numbers for easier access beginning with an area code of 002 then 01-005469323 and finally area code 002 then 0238551332. Those of you would like to drop their questions on the comment bar of my Facebook page or Huda TV Facebook page or Huda TV on the YouTube will be more than happy to accommodate your questions and answer them in the same order they were received. Let's take some calls. Assalamu alaikum. Musa from Gambia. Assalamu alaikum, Musa. Alaikum assalam, doctor. How are you? I'm good, alhamdulillah. Uh, I have a question regarding the hadith of sake, forsaking your brother. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this. Hello, you getting me? I hear you. Okay. So there is this brother. Hello? Habibi, just say your question. I, I hear you clearly. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay. So, uh, there's this brother. We, we were once playing football match. So, we fought. And I didn't know him. So, we dispersed our ways. But he stayed in the other town of the sound. He stayed in the other town of the side. Uh, on the side, other, other side of the town. So, we never met. So, we fought, but we never met again. So some time passed by around two to three months. I once saw him at his side. So I went there to play another football match, but I, I didn't call him I, and I didn't talk to him because I was afraid he recognized me the fact may I come up again. So I was thinking, does this had had this applied to me for not Fine. calling him? Barakallahu fikum. The messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said that two Muslim brothers or two Muslim sisters, they should not boy the, boycott the, each other beyond three days. And if they do, it's problematic with regards to the acceptance of their good deeds and so on. And then the Messenger of Allah said, uh, Normally when two people are having some sort of disagreement or discord, co-workers, colleagues, relatives, siblings, neighbors. So they avoid each other, even if they're entering the same masjid. So one will delay a little bit so that will not bump into the other one. So he wouldn't have to greet him or she wouldn't have to greet her sister and so on. This is what is meant of idbar, turning your back to your brother, turning your back to your sister, uh, avoiding them. You don't want to talk to them. You don't want to give salam to them. You don't want to hear the salam, so you don't have to reply and respond to their salam. And the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, the best of them before Allah, the best of them before Allah is the one who will take the initiative, will dare to take the initiative to go to the other party and say, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, is it sufficient for reconciliation? Like in your case, it is sufficient. Because there is no business hanging in between money transaction or dispute, family dispute, or there is a problem that we need to take care of in order to resolve the matter. There was an innocent dispute in a match. You didn't know him before. Now you meet once again. He says, Salaamu Alaikum, brother. And you smile and that will do it. That will do it. The Quran also commanded, The believers are but brothers, meaning brothers and sisters, like one family. So it is my duty as a Muslim that if I see two Muslims, whether they are relatives 
a husband and wife, siblings, uh, cousins, neighbors, co-workers, classmates, they knew each other before. And now what happened? They stopped talking to each other. Why? Over whatever reason. I shouldn't say, it's none of my business. I shouldn't turn a blind eye. I shouldn't be passive. The Quran commanded in Surah Al-Hujurat, فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ So it is the role of every Muslim to take the lead, to try to reconcile between Muslims who are having discord. If I'm in the bus and I happen to have a dispute with somebody and he went to his way and went, does this apply here? It doesn't apply because we didn't know each other before. But if we happen to see each other on a regular basis, then one of us will be best before Allah if he were to take the initiative and say, Assalamu alaikum. It would be even best if he says, pardon me, forgive me, and you know what, um, I don't have anything in my heart towards you. In an attempt to clear off the cloud that is between you or the dust that arose as a result of the disagreement. Obviously, it is difficult. And it is not something easy for a person, especially we as human beings have this kind of ego. We always feel that we're right and others are wrong. So you will find many reasons and many excuses to prove or convince yourself you're right and he was totally wrong. That's why the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, gave Bishara, he said to his companions about Abdullah ibn Salam, may Allah be pleased with him, that he is definitely one of the people of heaven. He is going to enter paradise while he was still walking on earth. Why? They figured out later on through Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As that uh, Abdullah ibn Salam doesn't keep in his heart any hard feeling towards anyone. He doesn't envy anyone. He doesn't hate anyone. Of the Muslims. May Allah guide us to what is best. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Abu Bakr from Malawi. Welcome to ask for Abu Bakr. If you can't hear me, please try again. Maybe you can take another caller, Abdul Hamid from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. How are you, dear Sheikh? I'm doing wonderful, alhamdulillah. And yourself? Alhamdulillah. How is your family doing? Very good. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Barakallah, Sheikh. Um, I got a, I got a quick question. Um, so the question is regarding um, facing the Qibla in Salah. Mm. Uh, but before I proceed with the question, could you please explain the meaning of of this uh, hadith that that I found in uh, I think it's Muwatta Mambalik that the Abu Raira radiallahu an narrated that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says. ما بين مشرق والمغرب قبلات. So between the east and the uh, west, mm. if I'm correct, is uh, is the Qibla. So could you please explain what that means? Right. And before you now explain that, um, what in the masjid that faces the Qibla direction, but when you compare the Qibla, the masjids. Qibla direction to the compass, it's not 100% accurate, but it's like 95% close. So say I want to lead Salah in this masjid, and I face the Qibla exactly the same point where the compass on the uh, the geo map is facing. So it's my direction wrong, because I'm not exactly following the main point where the masjid is uh, facing. Could you please explain Abdul those Hamid, allow me to answer both questions at once. When the Almighty Allah says, فَأَيْنَ مَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ And in the other ayah, وَحَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُمْ فَوَلُّوا وَجُوهَكُمْ شَطْرَهُ That explains it all. Wherever you may be at, you should face al-masjid al-haram in Mecca, shatrahu. So if you are in the haram, then you must be facing the Kaaba. You cannot be facing off the Kaaba right nor left because you see the Kaaba already. And you know, some of the funny incidents when somebody is coming for Umrah for the first time 
and he's in the haram and he asks Shaykh to which direction the Qibla is. So, حَيْثُمَا كُنْتُمْ فَوَلُّوا جُهَكُمْ شَطْرَهُ If you are in front of the Kaaba, then you must be facing the Kaaba, not the clock tower. And if you are in Mecca, if you are in Mecca, it will be sufficient for you to face Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Even if you're not facing the Kaaba exactly, would that be 95% or even 90% okay? Why? Because it's not possible if you are in Jabal Umar or Al Khalil Ibrahim or if you're coming from Ajiyad area or coming from the Gaza to exactly locate the Kaaba. There is no way that you can see it. So seeing the outskirts of the Masjid is sufficient. Okay. And if you're not in Mecca at all, facing Mecca will be sufficient. And that's why it is possible between the east and the west to have some errors facing a little bit off here, a little bit off there. Now with the campus, it provides an amazing solution. Whatever you may be at, it gives you an exact direction. There are many applications, but the applications require that there, you should not be in a, in a magnetic field or it should not be disturbed by sometimes if the building is uh, constructed of steel, it's extremely difficult to adjust the Qibla. Unless if they have done it before putting the foundation of uh, the masjid. So my advice is discuss with the uh, community, with the executive committee, with the imam of the masjid. Take the uh, your campus, your application, say, look, it's either way off. If it is something, as they said, 5% off, this is nothing, no problem. That happens because, as I said, far away, it will be sufficient to face Mecca, Umul Qura. But once I was in one of the states and I was about to lead the prayers and give the khutbah, then I just realized that it's way off. It's like, you know, 90 degrees. I said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give the khutbah here. You can give the khutbah and somebody else will pray. My presence in this place confirms it's okay. What happened? They said that, well, when they were building the masjid, they calculated the qibla wrong. And now it's extremely difficult to change. What do you mean extremely difficult to change? We're talking about 90 degrees. So I refused. But if it is a few degrees off, there is no problem. Barakallahu feek, Abdul Hamid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mustafa from Bangladesh, welcome to Ask Wada. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mustafa, how are you? Alhamdulillah, how are you, Jack? Doing wonderful by the grace of Allah. How can I help you today? Well, Jack, there is a hadith in Sahih Muslim which uh, narrated Ibn Umar reported that while we said prayer with the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one among the people said, Allah is truly great, praise be to Allah in abundance, glory be to Allah in the morning and in the evening. The Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, who uttered such and such word, a person among the people said, it is I, Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, I, it surprised me, for the doors of heavens were opened, opened for it. Ibn Omar said, I have not abandoned this since I heard the mes uh, Messenger of Allah saying this. So what is so the question? question is, yes, yes, Shaykh. So my question is, uh, in which part of Salah do you have to say this? Is Apart it when we say it's... Yes, Shaykh. Continue, Mustafa. Yes, so my question is, in which part of Salah do you have to say this? When saying Sana or uh, when standing up from Suya Ruku? Barakallahu fikum. So Mustafa, in the hadith in which Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard one of the companions saying, Rabbana laka alhamdu hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi, if you're referring to this supplication, and he said, he saw plenty of angels competing 
over who would write it first and it has become a sunnah and approved by the Prophet ﷺ to recite it upon rising up from Ruku'ah. Rising up from Ruku'ah. So there are several, several supplications such as ربنا لك الحمد ملء السماوات وملء الأرض وملء ما بينهما وملء ما شئت من شيء بعد ربنا لك الحمد حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا في these are all supplications prescribed to be recited after at تسميع which is saying سمع الله لمن حمد upon rising up from ركوع instead of تكبير my dear viewers it is time to take a short break and إن شاء الله we'll be back shortly please stay tuned Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back my dear viewers to the second segment in today's Ask Uda live all the way from our studio and we have Ali from the USA. Assalamu alaikum brother Ali. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I love you for the sake of Allah. Thank you so much may the one whom you love me for his sake love you as well. Thank you so much. Allah bless you. I have two questions. Yeah. I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, I have a wife. I, mashallah, I love her. She has children for me. Uh, five of them, alhamdulillah. And uh, she has blocked my mother. She doesn't talk to my mother at all. And this is just been recent. It's been a year for this issue. I've talked to her many times. And... Uh, she said, no, I'm not going to talk to your mother anymore. I blocked her. I don't want to uh, visit her. I, and uh, to a point, she said that she would she would not be able to come to my home. She is saying that uh, to me. And uh, that's one of the questions I have. What is the haq that my mother have up on my wife? Okay. Second question. The second question is, uh, I ask her, since you're not going to talk to my mother, I will come to my decision. And uh, if I leave from USA and go back to where I came from, which is Somalia, and I leave my children here, and would Allah put me accountable leaving my child in the Western and, uh, and, and, and uh, leaving here, leaving them, and, and not coming back here. Would Allah put me accountability leaving my children here? Where is your wife from, Ali? I'm sorry? Where is your wife from? She is from Somalia. And what do you do for a living? For me, uh, what I do for a living is uh, I am a consultant. Uh, that's what I do for a living. Taib. Yeah, Ali, basically... These are not ordinary questions. These questions require private counseling session. And it is not fair to say your wife is right or wrong without knowing what are her reasons, you know? And also advising her with her rights and duties. So please, I would highly recommend that you should book a private counseling session as early as possible. And uh, if there is no empty slots, I would uh, request my assistance to create one for you especially. Uh, because you're talking about a lot of serious matters. Secondly, generally speaking, does my wife have the right to restrict my mother from entering my house? No, she doesn't have this right. Okay? And I am as a husband, and I am as my mother's son, responsible to take care of both the wife and the mother and to prevent any friction in between. Uh, the rights of the mother-in-law upon her daughter-in-law, like an aunt, like a maternal or paternal aunt, she's not like her mother. She doesn't have to serve her. She doesn't have to, uh, she's not her daughter. But when she does so, she does this, number one, for the sake of Allah, seeking his pleasure or reward, and keeping in mind that one day that she will become a mother 
illu very soon. So she should keep in mind that she will be treated by her children in law the same way that she treats her mother in law. Number two, for the sake of the husband, because if if my husband, if your husband loves you so much and he's taking care of you and is fulfilling all your needs within his capacity, then the least you can do is to make him happy with the gods uh, the way that you treat his mother. Anyway, it's, it's complicated because I, I didn't hear from your wife. I don't know why. Maybe she has valid reasons. I cannot dismiss her right of explaining why did she come to this decision and what is the best way to handle this situation. So as I said, uh, I'll be more than happy, inshallah, if you talk to my assistant right now or go online uh, to spend time with you and your wife, inshallah. Barakallahu fikum. Returning back home and leaving your children, will you be responsible for them? Don't you think that this question came kind of very late? Why don't people ask this question before they uh, travel to non-Muslim countries? Why don't they ask these questions before they have children and mashallah, five kids? You know, some of them are teenagers now, I assume. And if you ask any of them that, you know, I'm interested in going back to Somalia, I say, you can go. He said, I want to go home. He said, well, this is my home. And guess what? Even your wife would say the same. So, you know, I started something. I got them used to a certain lifestyle and certain environment. Then I say, I just figured that this is not the proper way to raise my kids. I want to go back home. Really? Wallahi, this is very scary. Because at least when I'm sitting with them, I keep an eye on them. I give them nasiha, I supervise them, I make dua for them. You want to run away? You want to take off and that's it? Of course you're responsible. Who put them there? I'm not necessarily saying that, uh, you know, uh, because basically I would assume you're living in Minnesota, maybe. There are a lot of good schools private Islamic schools, masajid, Islamic centers. So there are a lot of brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, who are able to protect their children to the best of their ability. These matters have to be discussed uh, in private. Akhil Habib, may Allah bless you and your family. May Allah ease the way between you and your wife and your wife and your mother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Javair from India, assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me, Javer? Yeah, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, Sheikh, I have this question. Actually, this is a Quranic ayat. It says that do not kill your children for fear of poverty. Mm. We will provide for them and to you too. Mm. Killing them is a great sin indeed. Mm. So my question related to this is that if this is a promise from Allah that he will not uh, that the children will not be will not die out of poverty then why so many children die out of poverty so in this actually many of the people answer that this is a test from allah but in quran when it is promised from allah that he will not kill them out uh, out of you know uh, the hunger out of poverty mm -hmm. then so isn't it a contradictory thing that's happened or something we are not able to understand what actually allah wants to say us so I, this is my question you know, this ayah was mentioned twice with slight different wordings. Once in Surah Al-Isra and once in Surah Al-An'am. Am I correct? Yeah. When Allah the Almighty said, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ خَشَّةَ إِمْلَاقٍ That's one ayah. And the other one, min imlaqin. Both are of fear of poverty in simple English. Then in one ayah said, نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُوا Kum wa and in the other one said, Nahnu nazukuhum wa iyakum, which means, don't be afraid that killing your children will not solve the problem. What is the meaning of killing the children? Whom do you know that they killed their children out of fear of poverty? You might say, Oh, that was before Islam. And the early stages of the da'wah when people used to bury their daughters alive. 
وَأْدُ الْبَنَاتِ وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ It was very common practice, especially the girls, out of fear of, uh, out of, fear of shame, out of fear of poverty, out of fear of being captivated and taken as prisoner of war and being in shame to the family, which means because the, the tribes, they were living like a wild life attacking each other. So they take the girls and enslave them. The girl will not work to earn, to provide for herself and for the family. Rather, the man who will be providing for her. So they, look, they looked down at women. The Almighty Allah forbid that. And he made it a huge crime to do what do banat. They, they didn't do abortion though because they have no clue whether the fetus is a boy or a girl. But rather, once the child is born, as it is recorded in the Quran, وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنثَى ظَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًّا وَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ يَتَوَارَأْ مِنَ الْقَوْمِ مَنْ مِنْ سُوءِ مَا بُشِّرَ بِهِ أَيُمْسِكُهُ عَلَى هُونٍ أَمْ يَدُسُّهُ فِي التُّرَابِ أَلَا سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ so once the child is born, if it is a girl, then they will hide out of shame. They don't know what to do. And ultimately, they will dig a, you know, a hole and bury the girl alive. Can you imagine how heinous such practice? When you ask one of them, say, because, you know, she's a liability. She's not going to provide for the family when she grows up. But the man will defend the tribe. The man will work to provide for us. So out of fear of poverty, they used to bury the girls alive. Nowadays, they do abortion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing the following meaning. Habibi, do you feed yourself? If you ever say yes, you're mistaken. Because basically, there are a lot of people who are much more intelligent than you and less fortunate than you. Do birds feed themselves? They make an effort and Allah provides for them. Likewise, we make an effort and it is Allah the Almighty who provides. Allah has ordained certain amount of food or drink or life, lifespan, marriage, children. That's called risk. Health, sickness, that's called risk, provision. Inna Allah wa al-razzaq dhu al-quwwati al-mati. If you say that Allah says Allah provides for you and for your children. Allah provides for your children and provides for you according to the two different verses. The question is, don't you think this is contradictory? There are a lot of kids who die today out of hunger. I agree. I agree that there are a lot of kids who die out of hunger. Who kills them? Allah? No. Us as human beings. Who is killing the children in Gaza today? The Israeli occupation forces and the neighboring countries who are besieging them, preventing the food from reaching them. Do we have a problem on earth when it comes to provision? No, we don't. We have enough provision for everyone. If you happen to watch how many millions of tons of food a country like the USA annually, they ship. And in the middle of the oceans and the sea, they drop them. Condensed milk, wheat, flour, sugar, whatever. Why? In order to keep the market prices. So they buy the stuff from the farmers. They condense the milk, turn it into powder. Then they dump it in the middle of the sea. There is plenty of wheat. There is plenty of flour. There is plenty of food. And who is causing starvation in various places. Greed, the human greed, injustice, injustice, then, correct? When somebody pulls the trigger to kill an innocent person, when a thief breaks into your house, Habibi, can you say that this is contradictory? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, um, والسارق والسارقة فقطعوا وأيديهما. Yes, Allah said سرقة or theft is haram. And it's a major sin. And he prescribed for it a law. You as a human being, you don't like it. You say, well, this is very gross. This is very extreme. So you don't like Allah's law. But meanwhile, you're objecting that why did he let the thief steal? Because people only fear from 
the physical, tangible supervision and punishment. In the United States, when there was a blackout, even when there was, when during the September the 11th, those guys who were supposed to be in fear, instead of running away, while were covered with dust, they ripped off the credit card machines and the ATM machines. They took money which is not theirs. Hundreds of them were caught later on, and hundreds of others were not caught. Why do they loot? Why do they steal? While they are living a very, you know, reasonable lifestyle, and they have money, they have cars, they have houses. Greed, human nature. Did Allah allow this? No, Allah didn't allow that. Allah said there is a punishment for theft. If we practice it, no one would steal. But we don't want to apply the punishment. We don't want to apply the punishment for abortion. For abortion, we don't want to apply the punishment for fornication and adultery. Accordingly, many countries they have sixty percent of the children don't know who's their fathers. They run ads DNA who's the father. So when you violate Allah's law, why do you blame Allah later on? When Allah provided us with rain, producing the fruits and the vegetations, and we have plenty, plenty, Sudan, for instance. There is a civil war now. Sudan itself is sufficient to provide, not for Sudanese, but for tens of other countries. Very fertile soil. They have two rivers, mashallah. You know, if you just throw the seeds, they will grow by themselves, subhanallah. So who is creating the civil war there? The West is involved and many other countries. Greed, they want to keep this country poor. It's people dying out of starvation so that their products will be demanded more. They will earn more. Terrible greed. It's the human being's interference, Habibi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you could say, why does Allah allow this? Now you're returning back to the question of the reason of existence. Are we living in heaven? Are we living in hellfire? No. We're living in a transient life which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ It is transient. And he said, it's a test, it's a test. You don't like to hear this answer. But Allah said subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, it's a test. You pass the test, you go to eternal heaven. You fail the test, you disbelieve in Allah, you don't like him. Okay, there is an eternal seat for such person in hellfire. And by the end here, you have the choice. You have the choice to be a noble person. You have the choice to be a wicked person. Look, some people go, you know, my kids, why do they have to study so hard and go to schools and, you know, acquire degrees? While somebody can open a TikTok account or pose in the nude and they make tons of money online without having to go to school, without having to struggle. It's their call, their choice. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ But you'll be recompensed according to your choice. So Allah is addressing the true believers with what they should do. This is how it is. It's time to take a short break and we'll be back shortly inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the third and the final segment in today's Ask Huda program. We have Sister Amina from the USA. Assalamu alaikum Amina. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead, I'm listening. Um, Sir, I talked to you before about my case now and uh, I got a divorce through this date but my husband is saying that like I divorce you through system here. That is a Western. That is unvalued. If you public that to the people of our country, I will tell them I did not divorce you. Look, so uh, uh, sister Amina, of course, yeah. of course, it's a bit difficult for me to remember what I ate yesterday. Let alone remembering how many callers and their cases and uh, 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 and their requests. But I can tell you simply. A person who says to his wife, Anti 
in Arabic, in Somali, in English, in whatever, in Hausa, your divorce, that's an effective divorce. Now, following the process in the civil court in the States does not, does not affect the earlier divorce. It's just the paperwork. Between you and him, that you want to conceal the divorce or keep it private, this is something that you need to talk about it. But whether divorce is effective or not, yes, it is effective. And if it was the second or the first divorce, he still have the right to take you back within the idda. If he didn't and the three periods elapsed, he doesn't have the right to take you back. Unless if you're interested and, you know, may process a new marriage contract. Simple as that. Do you have any further requests? Okay, yeah. No, I'm not concerned going back. So, yeah, because my people are like, they're confused. They was like, if he's saying no, then no. I was like, there is no. Because if you open your mouth and said, I agree, and then he agreed to all the papers, and then now he's saying like, no, this is a Western, it's unvalued. I, I mean, like, you open your mouth, you say it. Remember, you Amina, the papers. remember, Amina, that's why I took the initiative. I, I give you a comprehensive answer. So we don't have to hear the whole story. Let him say whatever he wants to say. I give you the answer. You guys fight in a court. You take a lawyer. He takes a lawyer. He says, well, I cancel my divorce. You know, we have a system in, in our deen. الطلاق مرتان فإمساكم بمعروف أو تسريح بإحسان. He give you a divorce that counts immediately. Okay? If you and him are interested to meet with me in private, I will be more than happy to do that. Barakallahu feekum. Like to remind the viewers that we came up with the program of the private counseling sessions for this reason. You want to spend an hour, two, three, four hours? Wallahi, I go to sleep extremely happy after helping people. Either getting divorced or reconciling. Helping them sorting out their problems. Putting them in peace. Why now both parties are there. We hear them out. They speak freely with absolute confidentiality. With absolute privacy. But if you're talking live on air. And you're giving your narrative. To me that means nothing. I'm not going to give you an answer based on your narrative. That is not fair. The other party may say. No, no, she's not telling the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth. So why don't you come together and fulfill what Allah the Almighty said in the Quran? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Noor from Malaysia. Assalamu alaikum, Noor. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm surprised that I'm calling. <laughs> no problem, Alhamdulillah. And in a few weeks, inshallah, we will be in Malaysia, me and Mufti Mink and others. So uh, what is your question? Today? Subhanallah. Yeah? Subhanallah, inshallah, I'll try to be there. Inshallah. Okay, my question is regarding Wali. Mm. See, my father passed away a long time ago, uh, leaving Allah. my mother behind. Mm. his daughters um, my maternal uncle doesn't treat my mother that well his old age also uh, lived in the same country but far uh, my father's side living males are uh, my cousins they have their own family and live uh, say a little you know it's, it takes some time to drive um, towards each other's mm. place um, can you kindly advise me who can be my wali uh, you, no. and who no, from my side you should have, approach Do you him. have any grandfather? Uh, I don't. Or maternal? You do? Uh, I don't have any grandfather. You don't? Okay. Do you have a paternal uncle? Um, only one left, but he, uh, we're not really in on good terms and he's also old aged, lived quite far. Okay. Uh, so the paternal uncle and the maternal uncle, both you don't have good terms with them, right? Oh, um, no, not I don't have any more maternal uncles. So um, paternal, you have oh, sorry, paternal. Oh, I don't have any more paternal uncles, um, only maternal uncle and he lives far. Oh, so you only have maternal uncle and he's the one who mistreats your mother even though he lives far away. Yeah, correct. Okay. Do you talk to him? Um, seldom, 
Mm-hmm. Okay. The the kinship is not severed, but uh, yeah, seldom. Do you have any brothers, as siblings? No, I don't. Okay. Um, your maternal uncle, if you give him a phone and you say, Uncle, inshallah, I'm getting married, would you like to come and attend if he says, well, I'm old, I can't travel? And say, okay, can you give wikala? Can you attend? Come again? Okay. I'm saying, since you talk to your uncle, you pick up the uh-huh. phone, he's the only male relative that you have so far. You call him up and say, uh, you know, I'm getting married and would love to invite you. He says, you know, I'm old and I cannot travel. Oh, okay, at, at least can you appoint somebody or give wikala to somebody who can process the marriage contract? If he does so, problem is solved. So basically what you need to do is ask him to appoint maybe your local imam or a neighbor or somebody who's elder. He's not going to be the guardian. He's going to be representing the guardian via proxy. You understand? Since you're in Malaysia, you understand that you're following the Shafi'i Madhab. And it is completely illegal. And it is not permissible to give yourself in marriage since you already have a guardian who happened to be your uncle. In this case, he's the only male grown-up relative in the family. There is another solution in case that the guardian is mortal, like he doesn't want to talk to you, he's abandoning you. In this case, mashallah, the mufti in your governance, the governorate in your city, the grand mufti, the mufti, or whoever can be your guardian and can give you in marriage, or even the local imam of the masjid. Nor may Allah grant you success. May Allah make it easy for you to find the right spouse and grant you both goodly offspring. Unfortunately, you ran out of time, my dear viewers. Uh, until next time, I leave you all in peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance